coming up. On this week's episode of TechSnap, Adobe tells customers they need to pay to upgrade if they want the security fix. Kickstarter has an embarrassing security lapse. Plus, we'll answer a question. What's the difference between mirroring and a CDN for my website? And when should I use which? We'll answer that, plus so much more, on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 58 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on May 17th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy.com and I'll tell you more about them as the show goes on. And the live stream is powered by ScaleEngine.com which is incredibly awesome. My name is Chris, and joining us, like every single week, is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, man. Welcome to episode 58 of TechSnap, yes. and uh, welcome back from BSDCon. We're back on our regular yes. Thursday. You had a good time, I presume? Yes, BSDCon was amazing. Can. Now, uh, we're going to have uh, probably some follow-up on uh, BSD Can when yes, they get the videos uh, posted, right? Right. Uh, most of the talks were recorded, and they will be posted up on YouTube. And once that happens, I'm going to highlight a bunch of the really good stuff cool. that people might be interested in. There were some talks about uh, you know, some changes to ZFS and basically diverging from Oracle's version, since it doesn't seem that they're actually going to make any more versions. Um, uh, IPv6 security. Uh, there was a bunch of cool stuff about uh, new versions of PFSense. There was talks about, you know, a bunch of the internals of OpenBSD's kernel and so on. Yeah. Uh, talks by Kirk McCusick, which is, he's uh, basically been working on BSD file systems for 30 plus years. It's, uh, you know. So a pretty, pretty big gr uh, group of uh, some, some pretty knowledgeable people. You know, it yes, sounds uh, like you're at one of those where huge... you're really, you're rubbing elbows with the people that really know the stuff. Yes, uh, and there's talk about the new package system and a lot of BSD-specific stuff, but there's a lot of stuff that uh, I think is just generally interesting, like the IPv6 security stuff or Colin Percival's talk about uh, bug bounties and, and how to make them work uh, properly. A popular hot topic right now. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, okay, well, great. Then I definitely am looking forward to, uh, to, to chat about that. Yes, when and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to catch a couple of the talks I missed because they're basically there are three tracks running at once. There's like... Uh, development hacking, which is just playing with weird stuff, yeah. and um, and the sysadmin track. And you can only go and to so much. I, I, the, when the three of them at the same time, you can only be in yeah. one room at a time. Yeah. And like there was a really cool one about um, using the Aethros uh, networking switches, like yeah. the little routers, to actually yeah. as a switch and writing running FreeBSD on the chip <laughs> inside of it, and and doing all kinds of weird stuff with it. Oh man! And, you know, I cut like the tail five minutes of that as I was coming in to watch the next talk. Right. And it's like, I would like to know more about that. That's cool. They're going to post those. Well, uh, we've got a great show today. We do. Uh, some interesting news stories and also uh, some roundup that some of it's, some of it's I'm a little upset about. It's uh, yep. uh, an update to the uh, NDAA that's going in place and they're putting new uh, cybersecurity provisions in there. And we're going to talk about that towards the end of the show. Uh, before we go, though, because if you're watching this right now, I'm not sure when you'll be watching this. You might be watching it late Thursday night, and you still have time, uh, because I'm very excited to say that our new show, Unfilter, will premiere live tonight. Uh, of course, if you can't catch it live tonight, it's Thursday night at around 7.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it's going to be available for download Monday mornings, Jupiter Broadcasting's newest show. And uh, there are some, there's some angles to topics that are covered in TechSnap that will be talked about in Unfilter, some of a different track on some of them. Uh, and I think if you yeah. like uh, if you like these types of shows, you're really going to love Unfilter, and it's going to uh, be co-hosted by two new names to the network that uh, you will have uh, never met before, but they're a couple fresh of great down. guys. Yep, some fresh blood here on the network, and of course, including myself. So uh, check out Unfilter. If you're watching this after Thursday, you can download it starting May 21st. That'll be Monday morning over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. We're really excited. It's a really ambitious show, and uh, we've been working on it. I've never worked so hard on a show behind the scenes before launch. Like every show we do, I, every time it takes me more and more, you know, thought and process because I learn each time. And this show is, yep. I've, I've literally been just at, on the, at the drawing board since uh, early December, all through Christmas, all through the New Year's, through my birthday, through all kinds of stuff, through family birthdays, <laughs> thinking about this show so much and putting it together and working on like the filterfree.me blog that I've been running for a little while now, sort of. Mm -hmm. building a back catalog of stories for the show and, and analysis it's been uh, it's exciting to get so close and to have it go live tonight is 
It's pretty exhilarating. But all right, Al, well, enough about that. Yes. Enough about all that stuff. Why don't we talk about our first news story today, Mm -hmm. which uh, I have absolutely no idea. Although the term, uh, the the, uh, terms kicking around are credit card leak uh, from a major credit card processor. It sounds like it's a bad story. Tell me what's going on. Yep. Uh, So a credit card processor, a big one called Global Payments, uh, was breached and a number of cards were leaked. But it also turns out uh, that some of the cards that were leaked were actually the debit cards, like the Visa debit cards. Uh, And it resulted in some uh, interesting use of those stolen cards. And I thought uh, the details were pretty interesting and people might find it fascinating. Yeah. Uh, So Global Payments, which is a very large credit card processing firm, uh, was breached sometime before uh, March of this year. Huh. And it was a fairly big story when they were. Uh, uh-huh. I think we talked about it a uh-huh. bit. Uh, but they say as many as 1.5 million cards could have been leaked. Although some uh, industry analysts that have been looking at this say the number could be a lot closer to 7 million cards that were leaked. That's a pretty big difference. Yeah. Uh, so it was originally believed that the breach occurred sometime in January or February of 2012. Hmm. Uh, but there's some evidence suggesting that it could have started as far back as June of 2011. Oh, you're kidding. So that's probably why that large disparity on the number of uh, cards that could have been compromised comes from. <laughs> yep. Uh, so Global Payments, the company that was compromised, claims that they self-discovered and self-reported the compromise. Right? So they figured out they had been hacked and they started reporting it to Visa and MasterCard and so on. Uh, however, a number of banks that detected the fraud before that and reported it to Visa, yeah. say that they told Visa that the commonality they saw between all the compromised accounts is that they had made purchases at merchants that use global payments. Huh. Uh, in particular, the, the bank in this article that uh, I linked, uh, they had noticed that the credit cards that or all the uh, debit cards that had the fraudulent activity belonged to students that went to a private school and had bought things at the, the cafe in the school. Hmm. Uh, and that, you know, between all the debit cards that got compromised, it seemed that a lot of them all traced back to this lo- this the cafe, is. and that cafe used global payments. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so that does, that, that, that does make it sound like it's, yeah. you know. And then, so what appears to have happened is that the debit cards that were compromised uh, were sold to some criminals or whatever, or used by the people that stole them, but most likely you... Instead of doing all the work yourself, you just sell the cards for less money and let people take the risk of actually extracting the value out of the cards and so on. Right. Uh, so they, criminals started using them to defraud stores. So what they would do is they would go into a store like a Safeway or, or whatever big box type store and they would buy low denomination prepaid cards hmm. and gift cards like the $10 ones or $20 or whatever, right? <laughs> then they would go away uh, and reprogram the cards with like the magnetic strips on the cards with the details of the stolen debit cards. It's clever. Right? Yeah. Then they would go back to the store and they would buy high value prepaid cards with the debit card. Uh, so that, that way, if you get all the money out of the debit card right away yeah. and then you can spend the money separately uh, after. On a, on a, on once you have it on a card, that's, that's really right. clever. So basically, moving, it from the, moving the money from the debit card to the prepaid cards. Yeah. Uh, and then they would use the prepaid cards to buy big expensive things like TVs and, and, and Blu-ray players and when you and say prepaid cards, you mean like they're like prepaid MasterCards, so they could yeah. actually use them anywhere that takes MasterCard. Right. Yeah. They're and not like store-only cards. A lot of those prepaid cards, you can just walk up to an ATM and get cash out of as well. Yeah, so that's actually really clever. See, at first I was thinking like they got like you know a gift card just for that store, but no, this is these are these Mastercards. These are yeah. like almost like these things exist for this purpose. I mean, I, uh, not really. I know, I know, but right. come on, you got to figure this is extremely clever because well, you're see normally uh, what you, the reason why this is not more common and th- that it's so interesting is that when you buy stored value instruments like these prepaid cards or gift cards or money orders, mm-hmm. you're not allowed to purchase those with a credit card. Uh, because a credit card transaction can okay. be reversed. Uh-huh, right? right. So, so, you know, you can't go up and buy a money order or a, a gift card or a prepaid card with a credit card. Ah. Because if you use a stolen credit card, the store would be out the value of the, right. the card. Right, right, right. So they only accept cash or debit right. cards. Right, okay, okay, Because yeah. theoretically, 
you know, use debit card with a pin number or whatever, and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. it's not reversible. It's or considered right. more secure. Yeah, I really uh, haven't bought an in real life gift card in years. So you're probably yeah, totally right. Cause right. I always buy like Amazon. Well, I, I had to, um, I was buying, when I moved into this apartment many years ago, I had to have a uh, money order to, as the, uh, basically a guaranteed form of payment for the first month and last month. And I was trying to use my PayPal uh, debit yeah. card, yeah. which was a prepaid MasterCard as well. So basically it depended what button you pressed on the machine, whether it would run as a credit card or a yeah. debit card. Yeah. Yeah. And they wouldn't sell me the bloody money order. <laughs> so I had to go over to an ATM, extract cash, and then pay for the money order with cash. Right. And that's the first time I learned about that. Huh. And it's, uh, again, it's because they, they need that irreversibility otherwise they just you just walk out of there with money and then reverse the charge on the credit card yeah yeah so well okay uh so it sounds like there's a little bit of uh there sounds like there's a little bit of dispute about when it happened but what's yes. the impact uh and the other thing is that uh global payments claims that only track two data was taken from the cards track two uh, yeah and track one is the one that actually contains like the account holder's name and some of that other information oh okay uh and so it makes it harder to use the stolen credit cards Right, because most places when you put in a credit card also need want the, like the account holder's name and the address mm -hmm. verification stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and with tra with only track two data, that's you, you don't get all that. Mm -hmm. Although not every place does require that. Um, but with the debit cards, the track two data is enough because it has the card number, the expiry date, and that's pretty much all you need with a debit card. Right. right, or even a credit card when you're doing an in-person transaction. Mm -hmm. It's only on the internet where the name part of the card really comes up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so because of that, basically, they didn't think that only track two data would be useful enough to be exploited like this. But it turns out that if you're clever, you can actually do quite a bit with just yeah. track two data. Yeah. <sighs> so hopefully, uh, now, 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 just a reminder, this is details about a compromise that happened a while ago. This isn't a brand oh, we'll new march, compromise. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that feels like a while ago, but it really right. isn't that long. I'm right. sorry. Uh, so, okay. Well, any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, but basically I brought it up because of the interesting details that came out about what they did with the stolen cards. Right, yeah. And that how is they managed to extract money out of them. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good idea. I right, because they, like, they didn't just go in and try to use... Right, They, they went and bought uh, low-value cards in order to reprogram them because they needed physical cards to have the, credit card, or the debit card data on them. But then they didn't just use those debit cards to make purchases. They used them to buy high value cards and then use those to make the purchases. Yeah, I like that. That's the clever Partly part. because they possibly also, you know, you go and you buy a bunch of the high value cards and then you sell those for like, you know, 50% of their value. Yeah. And someone else goes to the store and actually buys the item. And yeah, and you still make and plenty of profit. If you spread it out that. and get lots of different people, it, it, the store doesn't notice that, all, you know, some guy walked in and tried to buy eight TVs with a bunch of prepaid cards. Yeah. That would be suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, should we move on to uh, this yep. uh, Adobe story here? So Adobe has uh, been kicked in the nuts a few times this week. And uh, it all started when they announced a uh, security update or a security vulnerability in Adobe Photoshop, yep. right? So what's going on? Uh, kind of, yeah. Okay. So Adobe... Uh, issued a release talking about a security flaw in Photoshop CS 5.1 and lower. Basically, every version of Photoshop except for the newest CS 6. Uh, so, it basically, it affects the ways that uh, Photoshop parses uh, .tiff files. Mm. And it basically, they use some memory after they've marked it as free. So, if somebody writes some other code into that area of memory in the meantime, it causes it to be executed. So basically, <laughs> somebody could specially craft a .tiff file so that when you open it, it <laughs> infects your machine. Oh, jeez. Basically, it takes it over and runs code as if it was the user running Photoshop, which, a, you know, a, a lot of people might file. run I love it. I love it. Yeah. You know, and it always changes that, uh, that saying that, uh, like, you'll hear people say a lot where, well, you know, you don't have to worry too much when you back up the data on your computer because data itself can't infect your computer. It has to be something right. that executes. It's, it's only a picture, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not, <laughs> right. Although it's not the first time we've seen that, like the the, no, when, sure. the Microsoft uh, Advanced Bit Map format, the WBMP or whatever. Uh, is, I remember making viruses for that in my Microsoft Security class in college. Mm. Uh, you know, it's like y if you open this file in your web browser, uh, which you could cause Internet Explorer to do just by embedding it in a web page, that's yeah. like a one pixel by one pixel invisible image. It would start uh, the calculator program. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez, Al, you're such a hacker. You're yeah. just uh, that, it, was, it was a security class. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway, 
what made this a bigger news story is that um, basically the vulnerability was reported to Adobe back in September of 2011. Yeah, okay. And the researchers, after 180 days or six months of Adobe not issuing an alert, not making a patch, not doing anything, the researchers publicly disclosed the vulnerability and that sure. caused Adobe to release their, their security posting. Okay. Uh, now, the thing that caused a lot of hubbub about it was Adobe's vulnerability announcement basically recommends that users upgrade to <laughs> Photoshop CS6, which oh. even they note in their uh, security bulletin, you have to pay to upgrade to CS6 from your CS5. So the recommended fix is to upgrade. Yeah, the recommended fix is pay us, and then you can have the patch. Love that. Uh, now, Adobe does claim that a CS 5.1 patch is forthcoming, uh, but they don't say when or anything yeah, like they that. Did, they did kinda, they, well, they kinda well, 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 we did kind of, they kind of came back, well, 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 we didn't mean we're not going to patch it. Which yeah. is meant if you're really worried about it right now, you should probably you upgrade. just pay us. Yeah. It's Which, like, we, we, we've patched CS6 already, so just buy that. Well, and the thing is, is CS6 is an iteration of CS5 which mm -hmm. is an iteration of CS5.5 or, you know, whatever. Yep. It's, so they, they could, I'm sure it's just a matter of backporting that fix. It's probably yeah. not that significant. It's just well, the TIFF part. The, so that's the more probably... Part, yeah. And the more concerning part is that they've known about this for six months. Yeah. There's plenty of time to make a patch. Yeah. And there's and a proof of concept exploits you know, out there now. Yes. So there's a proof of, compl uh, proof of concept exploit that you can use to actually exploit uh, vulnerable versions. And actually, there are two different vulnerabilities uh, hmm. to do with the TIFF files, and they have separate CVE numbers. Uh, this one particularly is about the first one, but uh, basically neither are fixed in CS 5.1, and both That's are it. fixed in CS We gotta 6. ban TIFFs! <laughs> well, they're not that common of a file format, and because this is in Photoshop, not in um, something like, you know, when it was the Windows built-in processor for the <laughs> WBMPs, yeah. and you could trigger it by embedding the file in a website. Right, that's bad. That's that, was bad. Much, that was a much bigger deal, because you could basically drive by infect people. Yeah. Uh, but basically, Adobe's response in this case uh, is suboptimal. They, well, you know, they've had six months, and they don't have a patch for CS 5.1, so they're obviously not that concerned about it. It's so unfortunate. They just, they just don't seem to, to get it. I mean, they've kind of gotten it with Flash a little bit, but that was after they had to be beat over the head about it. Yeah. I just, I don't I don't understand why a company like Adobe can't just get this kind of crap figured out. Yep. I guess it's just not where their head's at. Uh, any other thoughts on that one? Nope, that's about it. All right, well, let's talk about something that you and I don't think have ever actually brought, really brought up on the show before. We've talked about a lot on the Linux Action Show, and that's Kickstarter. And mm -hmm. they had themselves a little bit of a security lapse this week. And uh, I guess, uh, why don't we start off, uh, set people, tell people what happened, and then let's chat about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, so basically, the Wall Street Journal posted a story uh, saying that about that they were able to access about 70,000 projects that hadn't actually been launched yet. Dun, dun, dun. So they were, they were, had inputted some information to the site, but hadn't actually uh, gone public with that information yet. Right, so they're like projects that were getting ready to launch their Kickstarter effort or something, right? right? Okay. And, uh, you know, so basically the Wall Street Journal said for at least two weeks, they were able to access those projects via the API and get all the details about them. Hmm, okay. Huh. Uh, the information uh, that could be seen didn't include credit card numbers or other sensitive personal information, uh, but it could make users more wary of Kickstarter's data practices. And the other thing that it could do is if you were able to see other people's projects before they started, you say, oh, that's a cool idea. I'm going to launch my version of that same project first and you know, right. get all the donations. It definitely seems bad from a competitive standpoint. That seems to be the biggest impact there, right? Right, it's like the reason why the Kickstarter snooping. let you set that stuff up and then go public later is that a lot of these ideas are, they rely on their, the fact that they're a novel idea. It also and seems so like it would be uh, potentially bad for them, like in the sense of a blogger jumped on something before the Kickstarter people were ready to announce it and organize the funding effort. So they would kind of, you know, could potentially ruin a launch, those yeah, kinds of or things. Or a competitor actually stealing the donations oh, yeah. by by getting being the first to market in this case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, hmm. Yeah, so on Friday, the engineers uncovered a bug in the Kickstarter private API hmm. and it allowed some data from unlaunched projects to be made accessible via the API. Uh, they fixed it uh, and no account or financial data of any kind was accessible, so no passwords or anything. Although, you know, it's just, if the bug in the API had been slightly different, it may have exposed that data. Mm -hmm. Right, so it raises questions about how they isolate that data, mm -hmm. and and you know, if 
it's uh, Colin Percival said this recently uh, in reference to uh, I think it was Thirty Seven Signals had a, a bug where they accidentally released uh, some photos from somebody's project or whatever, and it was the best way to ensure that you don't leak other people's data is to have it encrypted in such a way that you can't read it. Yeah, right? exactly. Private data, it should be isolated so only the person that owns it can read it. If the site can read it, then the site can leak it. Right. If the site can't read it, there's no possibility of the site leaking it. Right. That's a great point. It's like, if, if you want to be able to do more than just promise that you won't share it, you have to encrypt it properly so that it can't be shared. Yeah. Right? Rather than saying you won't share it, you have to make it so you can't share it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so this... But basically, it looks like the bug was introduced uh, when they made changes to the API on April 24th, and they uh, fixed that uh, last Friday, by the sounds of it. I have seen a trend of the, new, or of the Wall Street Journal, actually. And this was the journal, right? Yeah, I've seen a trend of the journal where they've done uh, sort of over-the-top reporting. The way they kind of spun this is it sounds like Kickstarter has this security breach. This is more like an API bug. Right, but it allowed private data to be exposed. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, private like, data that was uh, theoretically going to go public soon, though. Actually, I just, the, the, the one security vulnerability I've ever found uh, that I published myself was I found one in the, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but the Kevin Rose started his own instant messenger thing years ago. I forget what it was called now. The Pounce thing? Pounce, that was it. Yeah. I found a bug in their API where I was able to read all of Kevin's private messages. <laughs> Anything good? Not really, no. Uh, uh, sadly. <laughs> yeah, that would have way better. <laughs> basically, by, by just iterating over the API, I was basically able to read all the messages. And, and you know, that's obviously a problem. And basically, it's the same thing here. Uh, it's that there's insufficient checking in the API mm -hmm. that making sure that you can only have access to what you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And that maybe certain data should be completely isolated so there's no way the API can ever access it. Right? Rather than saying the yeah. rule... Rather than enforcing what you can access via the API in the API, because the API could have a bug, you need to have almost physical separation of some of the data so that it can't accidentally be exposed. You speak the truth, sir. You really do. Uh, like, actually, in uh, our project, uh, Wagos, uh, when I engineered that, we store private data and public data in entirely separate databases. Actually, what, like, the private data is actually a MySQL database, and the public data is a Mongo database. Hmm. Uh, and because of that, with the API, you can only ever access data in Mongo, so no private data can ever be exposed via that API. Nice. Okay. It's not always possible to do it quite like that. Uh, it's just Designed, something engineered in. And yeah, it's engineered in. After it, well, it just happened to work out for that project. It's obviously not something you can blanket apply to just anything. But What are your general thoughts about Kickstarter? You think it's a cool um, idea? Can you I've, use it up in Canada or is it a US only thing? I don't actually know. I think it might be US only, uh, but I don't know for sure. Uh, oh, wow. I like the idea myself because it, and to me as somebody, like if, you know, today if I was going to launch Jupiter Broadcasting at Ground Zero, I think a Kickstarter would be an awesome way for me to get something off the ground without having to take investor money. Like in order to get to the level I'm at now, I would have to receive investor funds. Right. And uh, I just don't, I don't think, I don't want to ever do that because I'm held, uh, then I have to held, be held accountable to that person and they have control in a way that it, 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 Kickstarter gives control back to the users, the end users. And that's what I really right. like about it. And I think it's got a lot of potential for open source development. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, like I, I've, maybe one day something like a Linux video editor type thing could be in there that would, you know, get enough people to fund the developer so we could work on it for a year or something. Yeah. And you know, the, the BSD projects, if I kind of had something like this for a while, right? There's the FreeBSD Foundation, which collects donations mm. and sponsorship from companies and then uses that to sponsor projects. Like they just did one to uh, build the Intel video drivers into FreeBSD so that if you have a newer Intel machine, like laptop or machine that has the fancy integrated graphics, they'll be able to have 3D acceleration in, in X and so on. I like that. I or, like that. Know, they also sponsor uh, the developers to be able to go to these conferences and meet each other and so on. Sounds a, so, yeah. Okay. It's basically just a more organized version of this. And, you know, as Kickstarter has this place where you want, you don't want a board to be deciding what to do with the money. And you want a large crowd, right? You want right. maybe, maybe you want thousands of people doing $5 things or $10 right. things or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, that's about it.
All right, then. Well, let's take a moment and say thank you to GoDaddy.com for sponsoring this week's episode of TechSnap. We have a great deal for the month of May. It ends May 31st. If you use the code 25MAY7, that's 25MAY7, you'll save 25% off your entire order. But here's what's better, and I really want to tell you about this offer, because if this does apply to you, this seems like one of those moments that you could seize an opportunity and save a lot a lot of money to get something rolling, and that is the GoDaddy reseller program. We are offering 50% off, and it expires on May 24th. This is recording on May uh, 17th. 17th. So if you're watching this, you have until next Thursday. So by the time next tech, we won't even be able to we won't be able to offer this next week. 50% off the reseller program. Now, what is the reseller program? And again, this is for the pro or the super reseller accounts. The reseller program is a one-stop spot to go get completely set up to do some kind of flexible shopping cart. And you can do things like uh, you can you can use GoDaddy's pre-designed templates that they have for sites. You can actually really get going quite fast. They have a they have a total uh, they have a total backend system that you can use that takes care of tax and commission payment information. So that's really nice. Does the credit card processing for you, which I think you guys know how how great that is. A very yeah. nice backend inventory management, so you can dynamically edit prices, update inventory, things like that. And the inventory can be all sorts of things. I love how flexible it is. So if you want to do something from Print Fection and something from an Amazon affiliate store and something from Cafe Press. Throw them all in here. You want to ship something yourself directly, maybe some DVDs, some CDs. Put them in here. It gives you uh, analytics, stats, gives you overall sales reports. I really love the uh, the uh, if you if you're if you use like Commission Junction and things like that. This is a great way to set up a storefront for that stuff, and it'll give you your commission reports. And uh, of course, on top of all that, what's really great is not only you're going to get fifty percent off if you use our code fifty res four, and again, that's code fifty res four. You also get a ton of great free extras, and I don't know how long they'll be offering those. But like I mentioned, the pre-built website. But I like the things like the SEO optimization and SEO suggestions. They'll give a little scan and give you some ideas to, so that way you will rank a little better. Uh, the mm-hmm. integrated shopping cart, they'll do SSL certificates for you. And of course, they're bundling in the web hosting as well. So you can go there, you can get the domain, you get the hosting for it, you get your SSL certificate, you get your shopping cart code, and they'll also give you $100 of Google AdWords credit. Uh, so yep. uh, that's I think they a give you a Facebook go. ad credit as well. Yep, yep. So you actually, and you know, if you depending on what you're selling, the Facebook ad credits, I would actually recommend pretty heavily because the way Facebook ad system works is you can target a lot more specifically because people enter all their data into Facebook. So Facebook can be like, you want to target people between this age and this age. I uh, say they like this or went to this school or whatever. Whereas with Google, Google guesses how old you are, but so check this out. So I ran one time, I figured I'd just give an experiment. I'll run an ad for stoked. And uh, and just to experiment, I was able to target very specific age ranges. Uh, I could do different ads for different sexes. I mm-hmm. could I could I could quantify that I want them to be a Star Trek fan over a certain age and mm-hmm. not above a certain age. I mean, I can really nail it down to it's it's pretty interesting stuff. So check that out. And uh, thanks to GoDaddy again. If you want to get that fifty percent off the reseller, it's fifty res four. If you just want to save twenty five percent on your entire shopping session, it's twenty five May seven. And that's for new customers, that, that last one. So thanks to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode of TechSnap. All right, Alan. Well, I think that means it's time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to TechSnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or using the contact form over on the Jupiter Broadcasting website. That's actually how uh, this uh, question came in today. And uh, Alan, are you ready for Jungle Boogie's question? Yep. All right, sir. He writes, uh, hello, gents. I thought about a new question for TechSnap website mirrors. While most of the TechSnap audiences probably could figure out what it is, could you explain how it's different than a CDN like ScaleEngine.com and how mirrors are updated? Is it rsync? Are mirrors mostly geographically based, or would it make sense to plan it some other way? Do mirrored websites also have their own name servers, or is it common just to use a name server of the root domain? All my best, a jungle boogie, who uh, is often in the chat room. Um, the biggest difference is mirrors are usually donated, and a CDN is usually paid for. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's the first major difference. Right. Uh, a lot of times, mirrors have their own host names, although sometimes they don't, or sometimes there's an alias. Uh, for example, FreeBSD has mirrors. Uh, FTP.FreeBSD.org is the main one, and then there's like FTP1, FTP2, FTP3, or FTP2.US and FTP4.DE for different countries and so on. Mm-hmm. And most of those mirrors are donated by large ISPs or universities. 
Uh, and yeah, so FreeBSD doesn't actually pay for CDN anywhere. They just, mirrors are donated to them. Uh, and then yes, the mirrors are usually updated with uh, one of a couple different ways. Uh, rsync is popular because you're moving only the differences. Okay. Uh, you can also, uh, wget can do mirroring when you don't actually have access to the site you're trying to mirror. It basically spiders the site and yeah. downloads the content. It's <laughs> it a acts, different. yeah, it acts like an HTTP client. Just chuk, chuk, right. Chuk, chuk. Yeah. Uh, and then some of them, there's other ways. A lot of them use something like CVS to actually check out code or whatever. It depends on what the content is, which system works best, and also how much access you have from the site that you're mirroring. Right? Are they? Uh, some of them, the master site will push out to the mirror. Some of them, the mirrors will pull, and so on. Right. Uh, so the CDNs usually work a little differently. Uh, there are basically two types of configuration for CDN. There's push and pull. With push, it's kind of like Amazon's S3, or you can do it with Scale Engine does both, but uh, we mostly do pull. Uh, so with a push type CDN, you would upload the files to the CDN. So that's what Chris does with mm -hmm. the uh, episodes of TechSnap and so on. Mm -hmm. He uploads them to uh, us, and then and then we actually pull them from the rest of the CDN. Right. But that's beside the point. Um, and then, so on most of our edge servers, we don't ever push content to the edge. Uh, the first time somebody requests the next episode, this episode of TechSnap, the first, somebody, first time somebody in Germany requests it, it goes to one of our German servers and says, I want, you know, TechSnap episode 58. And the server's like, well, I don't have that. So it then calls uh, our server, our storage server in Toronto, where that episode happens to be sitting on a ZFS array and then it copies it across and it will keep a copy in uh, an LRU cache or least recently used. Uh, so then what happens is it delivers the file to you and then later, you know, a second person wants it and it delivers it to them and so on. So mm -hmm. every time after the first, it doesn't have to refetch it from Toronto. Right. And that works well. But eventually we run out of space in Germany. Uh, so then what happens is when you request some file that's bigger than the amount of free space left, mm -hmm. it goes through and finds the file that was used the longest ago. So the file that nobody's asked for in the most amount of time and deletes that. And it keeps doing that until there's enough room to suck in the next file. Okay. And, and so that's how... So with a mirror, you would keep everything. Right. Uh, right? That, like a mirror is usually uh, all of the files forever. And then once... And mirrors usually also sync, so if something gets deleted from the master, it also gets deleted from the mirror. Mm -hmm. Whereas the CDN doesn't actually know if you've deleted a file from TechSnap. Well, you and have to so use our API and actually do a purge to uh, delete stuff from the edges. Okay. Now, so uh, the way I think of it too is like in terms of Jupyter Broadcasting, we utilize both, right? right? A mirror is is what I use to I, every now and then do a complete mirrored backup of the entire website. And I mirror that mm -hmm. and I archive and I back it up. But the CDN is how we distribute things like our image files, our CSS uh, layout, our, our obviously the, the video downloads, uh, audio downloads, all that stuff is distributed via CDN. So that way it, it frees up the website to handle the traffic. That's so, another thing that's different is mirrors are usually used manually. Uh, right when you have mirrors in like uh, for Linux or whatever, you kind of, you pick one manually as a human thought mm -hmm. process and then use that. With the CDN, our global server load balancer decides which server to send you to. Right. There's one consistent URL, and then it decides where to direct the traffic. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that's a little bit different. Yeah. So there you go, Jungle Boogie. Hopefully that sets you down the right path and answers your questions. Uh, and, of course, you can send in your questions, just like Jungle did. Now, we don't always get to everybody's questions, but we do try. So if you if There are some yours, good questions in yeah. the back catalog that I'm going to try to get to as well. Yeah, so uh, maybe maybe one of these days we'll do like a feedback heavy episode or something to try to catch up a little bit. I yep. apologize. Uh, one thing we are doing is some questions that are not very technical that go into some of our shows. We're answering those in the faux show, uh, which in is the mailbag so, segment. Yeah. yeah, in the mailbag segment, which is kind of getting a lot of those uh, that uh, don't otherwise get covered in the show. So you can always check that too uh, if you don't hear your question answered. All right, Alan. Well, with all that done, I think it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. It's the Roundup segment, where we cover stories that didn't quite fit into the top of the show, but we still want to cover them, maybe give you a link to follow up on on your own, and they're almost always exclusively powered by the TechSnap subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. Thank you to everybody who submitted stories and voted them up and down. Uh, I love this part of the show. It's always one of my favorite segments. Alan, are you ready for the first Roundup story? I believe it is yours, yes, sir. Yes, it is mine. All right, take uh, it away. So a company called Runcore 
has developed an SSD that can self-destruct. <laughs> you so would has, like this. It has two options. The first one causes it to overwrite itself with garbage, uh, random noise, so that it erases all the content on the drive. Uh, but obviously, even with an SSD, that takes a couple of minutes or whatever. Uh, so in a real emergency, it has a button that basically overvolts all the NAND chips and, uh, as we like to say in the tech industry, lets the smoke out. <laughs> so because, this is like this message may self destruct. It can actually now it can actually self destruct. Yeah, it was originally developed uh, for the military. The okay, being, sure. You know, if you have, you know, the sensitive electronics in airplanes or missiles or drones, for example, uh, we covered the story a couple months ago when the Iranians managed to confuse uh, an American drone and make it land. Right, uh, and they've managed to get all the electronics. If that drone had had, you know, its electronics stored in a system where the SSD or all the operating code could self destruct. That would be very, uh, yeah, that'd yeah. be very good. Hmm. And so basically, it has these two options. The first one allows it to just erase all the data <laughs> if you have enough time. Uh, and that means that, you know, you can you don't, you don't reformat it. You, yeah. <laughs> you can reformat it and use the drive again later. Although, if it's critical, you can make it literally fry itself. Uh, that's kind of neat. I got to be honest with you. Oh, they have a video of it. Should I, uh, should I, kind of, it kind of makes me wonder how that gets past the uh, consumer testing. Yeah, it's right? probably going to be. You could probably only use it for limited right use cases. They they can't. Are they going to be able to sell it to? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm watching their video to see if it actually starts. Uh, okay, so this they got a gal here. She's giving us a demo, but uh, she's just teasing me with the talkie talk. She actually hasn't destroyed anything yet. They have like a. They have it hooked up to a little shuttle PC, and she's got a little clicker button. It looks like it's. I think she's got like a little clicker for the self destruct. Mm -hmm. Oh, I already did. I skipped it. All right, so here we go. Oh, she did it. So it doesn't actually make a big smoke. It's not a big stink. She already did it. But when she opens it up, Alan, the actual chips look burnt. Yep. That's what happens when you put too much voltage through them. Yeah. Oh, look at this. They got a little demo of it. Oh, this is... Okay, honestly, I kind of would like this in my laptop. <laughs> Especially like you've entered the wrong password too many times. I mean, it'd be a very expensive mistake if it was a mistake, yep. but I like the peace of mind. I don't mm -hmm. know what the hell I'd need to protect, though. That seems yeah. a little overkill, actually. Uh, about but, it. you know, it's just an interesting idea. And, uh, you know, seems cool. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, uh, the next story it, on it the... It sure beats the method I saw before. Uh, back the thermite? The, yes, the thermite to the yeah. in the, in the CD-ROM bay. Yeah. Did, uh, did you ever see that, speaking of Kevin Rose, that episode it of System? The Broken? That, yeah. Oh, The Broken. The, yeah, The Broken. It was, the show that preceded System, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's... Yep, yep. That's classic. Uh, uh, where they, for those of you who haven't seen that, they uh, they show you how you could set up your PC to be completely destroyed by thermite in the case you need to run, and they destroy a machine with thermite. They basically melt it in half. I, it's like it's like be MythBusters before MythBusters was blowing stuff up all the time. Kind of kind of scene. Uh, early yeah. days of uh, Kevin Rose podcasting back even before Revision Three existed. Oh yeah, this is this was. What founded Revision 3, actually. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, the next story is an interesting one. Uh, also, another person who helped fo uh, found Revision 3 uh, with one of their shows is Will Wheaton. Uh, mm -hmm. Will Wheaton was out saying, Hollywood, don't take away my torrents, because it's come out that Microsoft is working on a new startup company that's designed specifically to target torrent swarms and essentially flood them with, with bad seeds. Like, you remember, Alan, way, way back when Madonna was a popular singer and Napster was really big, she released... Um, like these phony tracks on Napster where, where it would say, don't download my, don't pirate my music, you jerk. And so it'd be like the full I file never size. I saw those ones. I saw ones where every 10 seconds they had inserted static. Oh my. So you'd be trying to listen to the song and you would get a little bit and then be like. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is mean. That is yep. mean. Or uh, movies, full fi 700 megabyte file size or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all just right. text on the screen of yeah. like, don't try to yeah. steal this movie. Uh, so does this not totally kind of feel, though, like the modern day version of that with, 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 this, with this whole sort of new yep. attack on BitTorrent is? And I really, yeah. I love that Will Wheaton came to the web and he's like, listen. Well, it's like, you know, he used it to download uh, Ubuntu. And, you know, we've, we talked about it recently, how if BitTorrent is used for what it was meant for, to relieve load off a web server for distributing media files, for example, the way you download TechSnap with BitTorrent, yeah, just with the web seed, legal is, thing to do. Um, that whole web seed system is just yeah. pure brilliance because there's no downside that's to using how, torrents. That's exactly how torrents were meant to be used. Right. You know, they've been adapted slightly to work with, you know, invisible trackers and and uh, the distributed tracking systems, 
because people happen to use them for other stuff as well, where there isn't a central website that wants to be tied to the file that you're downloading. Yeah. <laughs> now, if I was going to put on a tinfoil hat, I would say that it is in the best interest of big media and big corporations to squash BitTorrent because they can afford to pay for expensive content distribution channels, whereas mm -hmm. independent developers, open source developers, independent content creators like myself, who are more financially challenged, need to rely on a system like BitTorrent. If you take away BitTorrent, you're essentially taking away a means of independent distribution. Right, but even big companies use BitTorrent, right? Like Blizzard uses Blizzard? it to distribute their patches. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek Online used it to uh, the original downloader way back years ago. Yeah, yeah. well, dude, a lot of games when they're in beta and whatnot distribute yeah. the game client through Torrent. It's because, you know, they haven't sold copies of the game to have money to afford servers yet. And now the BitTorrent people are actually working on a means to do live video streaming over BitTorrent. Have you seen this? Um, a little bit, but not much. Yeah, I haven't I've seen a lot of details. A but number it, of different efforts and... P2P video streaming is never going to work. Better. I know, they, but they were doing a demo of it on uh, Twit Live, and they were streaming the Twit Live thing out to a few if hundred people. If it's delayed people. enough, it helps, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it did uh, start to build up a delay the more people that got on. Yeah, but uh, Will Wheaton made a valid point that, you know, shutting down BitTorrent because somebody might use it to steal a movie is the same as shutting down the highway because bank robbers might use it. Huh. Just realized that Will Wheaton kind of does the Brian... Well, I guess Brian's doing the Will Wheaton kind of avatar thing there. That's funny. <laughs> uh, it's great for Will Wheaton. I, I love, I love it when he comes out yep. and does like, stuff like that. Uh, too bad he had to play Wesley. Have to hate him for the rest <laughs> of my life. Uh, anyways, we have a link to the uh, story about Microsoft starting up that uh, startup to uh, try to take on BitTorrent. You can check that out in the uh, show notes if you like. All right, Alan, should we move on to uh, this ridiculous story about the state paying twenty two thousand dollars for each router? Yes. Uh, no. This is. This Sometimes is... you need a twenty two thousand dollar router. Yeah. If you're a library in a rural area that has four computers, you do not need a $22,000 router. No, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, I like, read through this article, and I have to tell you, so what happened was is there was a federal stim stimulus grant, and they got $126 million from it, and they spent $24 million of it on routers. And we're talking literally uh, routers that they equipped with fiber connections for locations that don't have fiber internet connectivity. They, every right, they single bought. router had to have a T1 card, which added $1,200 to the price of every single router, even though locations don't have T1 hookups. Because um, T1s are too slow, and everything has at least cable by now. And there was a big contract that went to Verizon. Verizon is supplying all of the equipment for this. Uh, you go on to, uh, you go on to read some of this. They tell, on the second page, they talk about how some of the locations that they, that they installed these routers at don't even have plans to get fiber. And the whole reason, the whole reason they got this original grant was to deploy fiber internet. And that included paying for expenses for the implementation of fiber internet, but it was actually originally allocated to do fiber internet and get the equipment you need. And you could do routers for these locations that cost five hundred dollars, not twenty two thousand. Yes, <laughs> that's just twenty two hundred or twenty two thousand dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like you know these routers are designed to run like an entire university campus. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I, basically, uh, the reporters talk to Cisco, and Cisco says, "You're insane if you have less than five hundred machines using this router." Right. Yeah, uh, it's an enterprise-grade router. Yeah, and they installed them in a library that has four computers. Not only that, but they didn't even pay a fair market price. So uh, you can get, like, yep. an, at an online retailer, you could pick up a new Cisco 3945 router for around $5,800, right? Yep. Uh, so they paid a premium on top of that, plus they install all the add-ons, like yeah, the so T1 cards and stuff. SPF, uh, or SFP uh, optical things, and then the yeah. T1 cards... And basically, they bought all the equipment to support every possible option at every possible site. And this, was, is, uh, this is in Virginia, which is... Yeah, it basically, it definitely seems West like Virginia. Whoever, uh, whichever vendor was selling the Cisco gear... Uh, Had a sweet deal. Basically, it. was giving a kickback to whoever was ordering this equipment. It or seems something. pretty clear. Oh, and the other thing that's funny is because these routers are so big, they actually then had the expense of uh, installing shelving units and ways to mount them in the right. different libraries. So, they're rather heavy, right? They're not. Yeah. They're not the fifty dollar. No. Most of these could have run off the fifty dollar router you can buy at your local electronic store. Yeah. That you would use in your house, because if you have fewer than eight machines in the library, that's all you need. So this is, is that forty dollar router at Linksys or whatever. So this is from the state of West Virginia, and it's all over. They also have schools where they've installed these. In fact, they have a situation where they have a school and a library on the same block, 
And they're being interconnected by having these $22,000 routers at each end of the location. So what they did is the school just bought a huge bulk of, or the state just bought a huge batch of them and then distributed them out there. And it came out that emails were were from their technical team saying, this is way overkill. We don't need to do this. We think we can do this for $568 per location. You're you're, you're shooting it. And they came back and said, no, we want every location to have the same equal opportunity as every other location. So they're all getting the same equipment. And yeah, and they're like, oh, we want these not to be out of date in five years. It's like, it's a router. I know. Uh, and in five years, things are going to be different enough that that router is going to be just as out of date. See, this is typical government technology approach where it's, we want every location to have the same access. So we're going to give, we're going to do the same equipment, even though different locations require different hardware. And on top of that, this, it's, it, we have to buy here. now for the next 10 years because we might not get funding again. So we have to buy it now. And this is definitely how school works is we got to, we got to use this grant while we can. But the reality is, is that if you just buy more conservatively, then down the road, as technology changes, you'll reach a point where you need to replace that for much lower cost. Well, it's It's, not just that. It's basically, this is a case of the person in charge is actually making a decision on what to buy, doesn't know what a Cisco router is, right? You just believe whatever he was told by the vendor. Whereas the IT people are like, no, don't spend $22,000. You can get everything you need out of the $500 one. And it's... Because, you know, even if they have fiber, there's going to be a modem that's going to have a freaking Ethernet connection. You don't need to buy fiber interfaces and T1 line cards for all the... It's yeah. so ridiculous. Should we talk about another story? It's in the roundup that's absolutely ridiculous. So uh, just a quick political recap. Uh, at uh, at uh, Right before, uh, right just at the end of 2011, quite literally at the end of 2011, President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which authorizes the U.S. government to arrest and indefinitely detain U.S. citizens without going through full legal process. And they're allowed to do this all over the world. Um, so, but, you know, it, 2013 is coming up and a lot of big budget things are being signed. And I got to figure that stuff out. So the NDAA 2013 edition is uh, on its way to the uh, various locations. And <clears throat> thankfully, thankfully, they've had to make it even better. And uh, check this out. The 2013 National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which is being submitted, which will be submitted every year to Congress. So it's getting ready for next year, includes language that would permit the Department of Defense to conduct broad clandestine operations in cyberspace. So just saying what uh, so I, I I caught I caught an NPR report on this and what they said is this is authorizing full military type responses to cyber threats so literally they can this gives them the legal precedence to respond from a from a cyber attack with a physical attack like a bomb dropping right. on your head or something like that I mean that's overkill obviously right. but so they could basically go and and grab people they right. think were related to cyber attack. It, it also sounds like it authorizes them. Now, the details are still very sketchy, so this is just kind of what people are inferring at this point, is that it could authorize them to do all types of online cyber warfare type legal attacks mm-hmm. that, like how we do now. It's, it's a pretty interesting precedence that's being set, but uh, it kind of seems like these are the kind of things we've been building towards for the last year, to be honest with you, is these, this type of rhetoric and those, those things. So, All right, Alan, should we jump mm-hmm. over to this Comcast story? All right, so Comcast, of course, uh, has gotten kind of uh, famous now for having their 250 gig cap on uh, home internet connection lines, and uh, they're uh, ready to take a new approach with those caps, Alan. Uh, First of all, uh, they're going to introduce a couple of new uh, tiered systems that are going to be in trial right now. The first new approach will offer a multi-tier usage allowance that incrementally increases usage allotments for each tier of high-speed data service from a current threshold. Thus, they'll start with a 300 gig cap, Uh, for their internet essentials package. Then they're going to have an economy package and a performance tiers package, and they would have increasing data allotments for each successive tier of high-speed service. E.g., you can get Blast and Extreme Editions. Uh, The very few customers who need more than each tier can buy additional gigabytes in increment blocks for $10 for 50 gigabytes, for example. Uh, There also is a second approach they're in trial, which will, again, set your base cap to 300 gigabytes, um, and then you can buy additional blocks at ten dollars to fifty dollars a gigabyte, or ten dollars for every fifty gigabytes. Uh, both in both approaches, they'll be increasing the current two fifty gig cap to three hundred gigs. Yep. So what this um, reminds me of is like uh, tiered cell phone service plans. Yeah, uh, we have pretty much the same thing here in Canada, except uh, we get a lot less bandwidth. Like your base package is lucky to include fifty gigabytes a month. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just hate like, this. Uh, I'm paying over $120 a month just to be able to do 250 gigabytes. 
So I mean, uh, like I do, I, I do an insane amount of transfer yes. because not only do I have the twenty four seven live stream going, but mm-hmm. we don't have TV service, so any TV we watch or movies we watch are all yep. streamed to us. Then I do all the productions of these shows with HD versions and mobile versions and audio versions that I'm uploading yep. and downloading every single day. Uh, I would I would literally have a serious crimp in my business with a cap, and and I hate the idea of these tiered plans. You can get the blast edition where you get this, and then if you do over, we'll charge you an overage free of ten dollars for every fifty gigabytes. Uh, and you know they're just looking over at AT and T and Verizon and the other cell companies and going, "Ooh, I see what they're doing there. They're making yep. billions." Uh, and you know the same thing was proposed here and uh, got shut down a little bit, uh, specifically because. $10 for 50 gigabytes isn't at bad. That's 20 cents a uh, gigabyte. It's a little high, but that's not unreasonable. Here, they were talking $2 per gigabyte. So, and of, co- so and of that, course, it, that would be you know, $100 for 50 it's always good. It's always good to keep in mind, too, that uh, Xfinity, the Xfinity yeah. services will not uh, be uh, subject to these caps. Counted against your cap. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but basically, in the CDM business, uh, you know, Scale Engine only charges nine cents a gigabyte for streaming video and actually for regular edge distribution the price is as low as six cents a gigabyte uh which is so, ridiculously you know, cheap that's I, basically at comcast scale they could sell you that bandwidth a lot cheaper yeah that's see, that's that is what drives me nuts is what people are used to thinking about it in terms of having to pay for bandwidth but comcast owns a lot of this infrastructure they own a lot of these major connections and they have deals in place so that providers who are using their network a lot like ie netflix they're paying Comcast money. So they're making money on both ends here. It's not like Comcast is hard up well, and they're losing Netflix money. Netflix wouldn't have a deal directly with Comcast because Netflix uses Limelight or Level 3, I forget. Right. Something. But right. yeah. The CDN, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this, the, the way the internet bandwidth works is kind of weird. Uh, should we? Because, oh, you know, technically, none of, no bandwidth on the internet costs money. Yeah, well, the bandwidth is a scarce thing. There's only only so many bits in the world, Alan. Don't you know? Uh, once we use up all well, our there's bits, only so much, there's only so much capacity. But and and the idea behind that is that by paying for that capacity, you pay for them to get more of it and to maintain it. Just a lot of times they don't. Yeah, I like their token fifty gigabyte cap increase too. What a joke! In four years, a fifty gig cap. Give me a break. Hey, most people here are lucky to get 50 gigs. I, it, so, it, it worries me because how are we going to distribute? This is a decent, is, is starting to get, you know, you that's get enough f- to be able to download all the Jupiter Broadcasting shows now. I guess. In a month, right? All right, well, let's go to this next round. Right? Let's go to this next roundup story because not everybody's a Comcast user, so they don't care. Uh, but it's, basically, 50 gigabytes would be enough to watch, you know, eight or so Netflix movies in a month. Maybe a couple more than that. No, it'd be more than that. More like 20. So every you could watch a Netflix movie every night of the week, but not the weekends. Please, uh, Comcast, can I have some more internet? Hey, Don't yeah. use up all of my bits, Comcast, please. That's stupid. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some more stupid ISP stuff. You have a good story in here. New report yeah. lists the top 10 legitimate sites blocked by UK adult content filters. <laughs> yeah, so basically in the UK, they have a, they've, uh, they're trying to introduce this porn filter for the regular internet but right now it only applies to mobile think of the children alan think of the children the open rights group did a a study and found uh you know 10 very legitimate sites that are being blocked by the system because you know you can't block things on the internet because there will be more false positives than false negatives yeah ehow.com that's interesting biasedbbc.blogspot so they, so they blocked somebody's blog who likes to call out the BBC because it's a hate yeah. site they say or you know it's like eHow it's like what if I need to learn how to tie my tie yeah you're blocking this on my cell phone yeah I guess I got I got an email from a from a viewer who says their work blocks it because of uh, our content and we don't I can't think of what that would be <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, they say they blocked Jupiter Broadcasting it's mm-hmm. crazy it's crazy Alan well there you go do we have anything else in the show uh, nope, that's about it. All right, so uh, there you have it, everyone. There's uh, this week's episode of TechSnap. Uh, if uh, if you are one of the people, one of the many people who uh, shops over at Amazon or Newegg 
or uh, some sites like that, I would like to remind you that we do have an affiliate program. If you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of our website, down there you will see links for Amazon US, UK, Newegg. Somebody just got themselves a sweet rig off of Newegg. I get so jealous because nice. there's no like identification information, but I'll see like what items sell well. And this guy, this guy just had this sweet machine that uh, he just got, um, and he did that through Newegg. Somebody bought uh, their significant other an engagement ring through Amazon. Uh, that Ooh. you guys. Thank you for supporting us. Literally, you're keeping the lights on. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, uh, if you could, uh, before you shop at Amazon or Newegg or ThinkGeek or Best Buy or Audible or Gamefly, please consider using our affiliate links at the bottom. You just have to click there, and then it tags your entire shopping session. You can also grab that Chrome extension, and it just does it for yeah. you. I need to go to ThinkGeek. Uh, lesson number one from my trip was that I need that headband earbud thing from oh, yeah? ThinkGeek. Yeah. Uh, because trying to listen to audiobooks uh, while you're sleeping when you can't use speakers. Oh, yeah. Very handy to have that. You know what I have is I have a I have an under speaker, a little soft. Uh, I have an under pillow soft speaker that I I slide oh, underneath my uh, sheet, so it's not it's not exactly under my pillow. It's underneath my bed sheet, and then so that way it doesn't you know slide around. Love it, and it it, it resonates into the pillow, and it makes the pillow kind of a quiet sound chamber. So it, I love it. I got mine. That's from, an interesting idea too. I got but mine yeah, from Amazon. Basically. Trying to use earbuds in sleep was annoying. It's a pain so in the butt because, yeah. The headband yeah. thing would be great. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the headband works well, too, and it keeps your head warm. Uh, also, yeah. uh, if uh, if you don't use any of those shopping sites but you still want to help us out, we do have jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate, and we've seen a big drop in our donations in the last 30 days. So I am putting a request out for anybody who might want to consider a monthly $2, $5, or $10 a month donation to support the network. I would much appreciate it. And you can do that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash donate. You can also set up custom specified. You can say, well, I'll do X amount for a certain amount of time. Uh, if you think, you know, you could afford to do it for a little while, but you don't want to commit to anything too long, you can mm -hmm. do that. And much appreciated to everyone who supports the network. With all those PayPal subscriptions, you can log into your PayPal account and cancel it at any time. Yeah. There's no commitment, actually. Yeah. Yep, PayPal is super easy about that. Yep. That's what I like. All right, Alan. Well, thanks for the great show. We'll see you right back yep. here. Uh, we do TechSnap live every single Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Boom. And of course, we also stream it over at jblive.am. If uh, you're like at uh, your uh, cubicle or something and they don't want you streaming video, but you still want to yep. listen in, go it's to JB Live. audio only that way. I also try to set the bit rate low enough that it still sounds good, but we should work over 3G. So if you're driving down and stuck in traffic and you've got like an audio jack for your smartphone or something, you can stream it that way and listen while you drive. Mm -hmm. And there's always something on that stream. So if you're just bored in traffic and want to tune in, if we're not live, there's still there's uh, reruns playing. So you can just catch something midstream. So, yep. all right, Al. Well, thanks very much. And uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in to this week's episode of TechSnap. And we'll see you right back here next week. Bye.